Okay, welcome to Langer's uh, 2023 safety day. Those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Richard, I'm the Chief Instructor, but I think I'm familiar with everybody that has a But um, Safety Day was established years ago, uh, mainly from the US, you know, as a way of educating or reminding experienced jumpers about what they do and about safety aspects. It's used as a tool quite often. Uh, each year we try and run a few <coughs> topics that are different to previous years. So it's used as an education tool as well for you. It's an opportunity for you to interact with instructors before the season starts. Yeah? Refresh your emergency procedures, ask questions. Maybe your equipment has changed over the last year. Perhaps some aspects of the way or how you jump have changed. So it's really an interactive day, uh, fairly fluid in terms of the agenda, uh, where we can work together uh, to help improve your skills. We'll just refresh that. Basic schedule Laura's produced for us today. So this morning I start with a little review of last year. So it's good just to look at how we had incidents, why we had incidents, uh, and perhaps um, what we can do just to reduce that instant rate. Are there any trends that are noticeable uh, here or uh, across the UK or even more globally? Um, so I'm going to look at what we did last year and what incidents we had very briefly. Um, and then also I'm going to talk about the safe use of social media, um, something that I uh, started a little while ago, but uh, we'll come to that. Then there's a bit of a break. Bob is revived and revived by Laura. Hey. Um, Bob seems to turn up on safety day and, and have an unfortunate demise most of the time. Uh, so Bob is here. Some of you will recognise a bit of Bob in you, I hope. Well, I hope not. And then we've got aircraft safety with Josh, then a lunch break. And then this afternoon session will be largely Hangar 2 based, that's the training centre. Um, Karen is going to do a section on equipment. By all means, take your equipment with you if you wish. Um, there will also be an ask a, a rigger or instructor session as well down there. So Karen's bit really is more presentational, uh, but then there's the opportunity if you want to ask her about your equipment, perhaps later on in the day. Safety drills are always an important part of what we do. We're fortunate as skydivers in the modern world not to have too many incidents or malfunctions. They're uncommon, but because of that, we can sometimes be unpracticed with our emergency procedures. And sadly, it continues within the world that there are qualified jumpers that don't survive their skydive simply because they fail to deal with a malfunction in what is often referred to as a timely or controlled fashion. They literally hesitate and don't know what to do, or they pull the handles in the wrong order, or pull the hand handles in the wrong way. So simple emergency drill practice uh, is a useful part. And then Kaylee's going to talk a little bit about safety on the drop zone and how we present ourselves to our fellow jumpers, how we work and, and uh, how we are together as a community. So that's the basic plan um, as we go through the morning and the day. Have we got any students here? <laughs> Squeeze up a little bit rather than everyone stand there because that's about the worst place to stand, both from a physical door location, but also I'm going to be referring to what's on the screen a lot of the time. Um, so you want to be pushed slightly. If you want to sit on the floor, that's the area that we need to. <coughs> All right, I asked about students. Uh, students are more than welcome, but if this afternoon when we're doing, for example, emergency procedures, our safety drills, you might see techniques or concepts that are slightly different to those that you were taught initially as a student. Uh, do not change anything if you're a student jumper um, until you have verified what you've seen with an instructor. So just don't change things. As a qualified jumper, of course that's the first thing today, is to test your mind a little bit and think about how you would feel and cope with various different scenarios. Last bit before we actually start. That's the fire escape. If we have a fire, we're leaving that way. All right. Safety review for 2022. What did we get up to last year? Uh, last year for us was a busy year. It was the busiest skydive year that we have ever had, and we believe it to be the busiest that ever occurred in the history of British skydiving. 
we did 49,000 plus <coughs> slots, people in aeroplanes. Slightly different way than British skydiving system. They measure a tandem as being one jump. We measure it as being two people inside an aeroplane. So that's where you get the discrepancy. That figure plus that figure comes to where So we have nearly 50,000 people climb into an aeroplane and subsequently jump out. 41 plus thousand of those were qualified jumpers. That's always been Langer's uh, premise and goal is to uh, get experienced jumpers up in the air. That's part of our, our center of excellence uh, concept is to get you guys started. So much of what we do uh, relates to qualified jumpers. We also did a little bit of AFF uh, and a little bit of category system stuff. And we did uh, a relatively small, one in about eight, uh, one in about 12 jumps. 8% uh, of the time skydivers. Overall, in British skydiving, British skydiving last year reported about 260,000 jumps. So we made up nearly 20% of the UK skydiving scene. <coughs> and proportionally, uh, AFF, we we're about equivalent to that. Um, static line, there are a couple of big centres. There's military centres, for example, that very much focus on static line. So it's not a surprise we do slightly less than the national average. Uh, although proportionally for some of the civilian centres, the amount of static line uh, student jumping uh, of that form, uh, we do quite high. What is interesting is that when people learn AFF or they learn to do static line jumping elsewhere, they're often coming here to complete their training. This figure is quite high. People come here and we regularly recognise that we're seeing uh, Spanish trained AFF <coughs> that are UK based, but they've gone to Spain, they've either failed to complete their course or for some reason uh, not got their air license, they come to us. We also see uh, a lot of uh, static line trained students from other UK centres come to us. So that's a reasonably high figure. Uh, tandem, relatively minor. We're not a tandem centre. We're not uh, uh, any of the other big centres that's very much focus on tandem. And then uh, we accounted for almost a quarter of the UK qualified skydiving jumping. Incidents. Uh, last year we had 56 reportable incidents where the use of a reserve was required. And that went up from 31 in the previous year. So although we did more jumping, we also did we also had more incidents. There was a slight increase on the student side. Oddly enough, we seem to have a, another year where we had quite a few total malfunctions last year among students. Uh, our tandem figures didn't change, which is good because uh, we did a lot more tandem last year but our instant rate did not change. But what we did see is a doubling of our qualified jumper instant rate. We went from 20 to 40, uh, and that's quite a, a big jump. There were also 14 additional reports that were made to British Skydiving. Uh, they relate to non-reserve use incidents, off landings, losses of helmets or equipment in free fall. We had two qualified jumpers lose their helmet, one of which was a full camera setup. Um, maybe they just, it's assumed they just simply didn't do it up. They lost it on exit. There was another one that lost their helmet uh, when they turned to track. Yeah? Not that No, that wasn't you. That was All right. <laughs> uh, so overall, we had a reserve uh, use rate of 1 in 813 compared to British Skydiving's national average of just 1 in 15. So we are not good skydivers from an instant rate point of view uh, here at Bangor. And that's definitely an area that I need you guys to try and always reflect on and improve. Now we could argue that if we went to a centre that only ever jumped 280 square foot student canopies, their malfunction rate would be less. Uh, some of what we do at Langer does tend to lend itself to a slightly higher incident rate. But it's also fair to say that the argument that while well, some of us will be jumping very small fast parachutes, so they will malfunction more, isn't actually that viable. There are people within the, in the world that have 20,000 jumps on the likes of Valkyries and Velocities without having malfunctions. So there is proof out there that this, you know, that you can jump high performance parachutes without any problems. Um, it's certainly, you know, we need to look at a little bit of how we reduce our incident rates. Same thing as earlier, try and push yourself into that gap up there without disturbing the camera or into this area here. 
A, that's the far escape. B, that's the least visible of the screen area. <laughs> Main culprits, for instance, last year here. Uh, I was trying to get people to be quite sort of discussive on their incident reports and almost self-critical. You know, why did I have this situation? Most people though are very sort of simplistic. It was spinning. I cut it away. In fact, sometimes I had an incident report this week that said light out. That was it. No cutting away. No landing safely. Nothing else at all to report. Just light out. Uh, so we had to fill in a little bit more to sort of help British skydiving. But essentially, uh, ten were, I opened my parachute, it was rotating in some form, and I therefore cut it away and used my <coughs> reserve. Uh, a couple of those cited potential brake fires, so we've simply got a packing and an equipment issue. A couple of those people uh, cited that they just simply did not know why their parachute was turning. On every jump, analyse how our parachute opens. Did it open on heading? Am I a safe person to jump with other people? If I do an eight way and I know notoriously that every jump I do my parachute turns on deployment, something's not quite right there. So we can be self-critical to help reduce this quite easily. And as I've already said, there are people around the world doing thousands of jumps on very high performance parachutes and they don't have this problem. So it's not just a generic, well, it's the kit I use. Um, it, it's more to do with the, the user Wing suitors were a culprit last year. Um, we've had four reserve rides this year. Two of them are wing suitors. Um, five of those again, um, rotational during deployment, so they had twists. It can be complex to remove twists uh, when your legs are tied together by fabric. Uh, and then we also had one guy that lost control as he went to deploy his main. He became unstable. Um, he wasn't particularly familiar with his wingsuit that he was using. Um, he elected simply to deploy the reserve. Now, I'm not really familiar with unstable emergency procedures, but um, whether they should have tried to use their main or not, I don't know. But anyway, that was the course there. We had the other group, if you like, was CF. Um, a little bit of misfortune. There were a couple of broken lines, but I think that can also be argued that there was some aggression in the docking and so on. Um, there was a big way wrap. And there was a couple of odd ones as well. One pilot shoot wrapped round arm or something. And then also uh, there was a pilot shoot in tow, which is... So they were the sort of primary culprits. Yeah, that accounts for more than 50% of our emergency procedures. As I say, there were then a few random totals and another little bit in there. It might be about covering here. I was going to say, is, is there any analysis on kind of self pack versus pack jump? No, but for qualified jumpers, the, I mean, the general assumption is that the person jumping the kit is a packer or certainly. Um, on the instant for report, in report form, it does ask who packed the kit. And actually, I've not really had, I've not analysed that, no. Um, but, <coughs> speaking of that, what's the best way to prevent? Incidents, malfunctions, what would you suggest? Come to safety day, no. <laughs> yes, why not? Just it's making sure you're checking your kit properly. Yeah. Everything is packing. Yeah. If we pack well, we immediately reduce incident rates. Brakes fixed on, I couldn't get one brake off, I could only get the other brake off. Hard opening, slider came down, knocked toggle off, had brake fire. Slider, something else wrapped around this. Um, I opened, I had a, I'd not packed my kit properly. You know? I had a step through. We seem to notoriously still get one or two step throughs. <laughs> this year, not too bad. The previous year, it wasn't right when I packed it in my kitchen. Well, I say my kitchen, actually, it goes through my hall into the lounge. <laughs> so when I put it in the bed, it didn't look right. And, uh, and they'd been here for an hour in the morning. So just repack it. Mm, yeah. See, had a few hours to go and look for that rebar. Uh, another suggestion. <laughs> of course, we can also 
pack better. <laughs> <laughs> There's a theme here. Uh, and we could also argue that it's important to understand our equipment, how it functions, what it needs to, from us, a little bit of kit <coughs> care to stop toggles coming off. We, again last year, as we've seen previously, had a situation where the excess brake line interfered with the removal of the, the steering toggle and that resulted in them cutting away. That's just learn how to set your brakes. Yeah. Um, so understanding your equipment, understanding when it needs a little bit of care and a bit of maintenance, needs to go and see Karen, those sort of things. Prevention's really one of those things that I can't stand in the hangar and watch 49,000 pack jobs. Um, what I can do is ask you guys to always be careful with your packing, especially when we're uh, relatively inexperienced, we're rushing to get in the aeroplane, yeah, it's one of those factors that adds into that chain of events. Injuries, I'll just cover briefly. Uh, we had 16 injury reports last year. That's about one in 2,800 jumps. Uh, the British skydiving average was just a little bit higher than that. So we actually do very well from an instant, uh, from an injury point of view. And that's relatively consistent over many years. Langer jumpers don't tend to hurt themselves as often as the national average. Uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, we've got plenty of space, in theory, unless you land in the car park. Uh, other than that, you know, you know, we just seem to have a relatively low instant rate. Uh, and what was also good to see last year is that we had no serious landing injuries involving qualified jumpers. And that's your, your classic low turn, beamers, hips. The, the really nasty stuff that's going to occur. Uh, is that an effect of the charts and the slight slowing of people in the three, four, five hundred jumps from downsizing to that 150 too early and then 135? Possibly, my gut feeling without any real evidence is probably uh, there's a little effect there. I certainly have seen a, an in less near misses with people under canopies in that sort of 300 to 1,000 jump range. We always used to say that the dodgy area for qualified jumpers was 200 to 400 jumps. Actually, it's much more expensive now because people can do two or 300 jumps in a, a very short period of time. The one thing that's still consistent with skydiving is we cannot fast track our learning with canopy control. We can go on courses to improve our understanding, but we can't go in the wind tunnel with our canopy like we can with uh, FS or free fly on here. So canopy flight is still the uh, the hazardous area for us is still obviously, but fundamentally injuries occur when we strike the ground in a way that was less controlled uh, compared to how we should be. Uh, so yeah, that's really the key part there. Any questions? The British Skydiving Report is tandem or not? Yes. Is that tandem malfunction right? Yes. Um, we are relatively compatible. I left tandem out of this largely because not the audience, but we can cover that. Um, yeah, what was it? Seven, seven, we had seven last year, yeah. Okay. We're good. We can be better in some respects. Um, the Swiss cheese model, if people are familiar with that, from a, a, a risk assessment, basically you've got these layers with cheese with holes in, line all the holes up, that becomes a serious incident. We only need to want, remove one of those holes, one of those layers of cheese, and remove an instant. If we can walk to an aeroplane with a parachute that's packed properly, we can eliminate a lot of the nasty events that could occur in future. You know, I landed off when everyone else landed back on because I had half a twist, and it took me half a second longer to deal with that, and then this occurred, and then I couldn't get back, and then I couldn't, you know, and the whole chain of events starts with a good pack job. Fundamentally, time we jump out of an aeroplane, we are wholly reliant on the bags of fabric that we're wearing on our bags. So, as much as I'd like you to look after yourself, really what I'm also saying is look after yourself.